Hello, Internet. Welcome back to Matt Presents, that wonderful show where I have movie nights and then I talk about them with you. This week, we did three musical sort of mockumentaries. One of them wasn't really, but uh, mockumentaries. So, to start off with, we talked about the original mockumentary, the original musical mockumentary at least. The Ruddles, All You Need Is Cash. Um, I believe the first mockumentary was actually Woody Allen's Take the Money and Run, which is a very good movie. I recommend it. But uh, this is one of the very earliest musical mockumentaries. Um, obviously parodying the Beatles. The Ruddles are supposed to be the Beatles. Um, I guess in this alternate universe where the Beatles never existed. Because a, a lot of their songs are similar to uh, Beatles songs. Um, not They're not parodies of Beatles songs, but they are musically similar. Especially the song Get Up and Go. Um, sounds very similar to Get Back, to the point um, John Lennon... <laughs> sort of warned them, like, hey, you might get in some legal trouble for that one, so just be careful. And they have ouch, which sounds a lot like, um, help. There's, yeah, there's, you know, a lot of others in there that are clearly based on specific Beatles songs, but not quite a parody of Beatles songs. I mean, uh, the whole... The whole trio of them, it's kind of hard to figure out who's supposed to be who. Because they all sort of take elements from all the different uh, Beatles. If I can remember their names. Oh, it's written on the back. Hell yeah. Uh, Dirk, Nasty, Stig, and Barry. I can't remember which one is which. I remember Eric Idle. Eric Idle is Dirk. And Dirk is mostly supposed to be... Uh, Paul McCartney. That's his role in the group. There's one of them that is very, very John Lennon, but the other three all sort of could be any of the Beatles. Um, and of course, much like the Beatles, they become a huge success in America, or they become a huge hit in Britain and then America, and they're one of the most popular bands in the world, and then they break up in the late 60s. And throughout it, there's just these funny, wacky, wild escapades, you know? Not not much of a story to it. It's mostly the story of the Beatles, um, with a lot of jokes and things that didn't happen thrown in. It's uh, one of the few mockumentaries I've seen that actually plays around with the documentary style a bit. And I mean, bits where, like... Um, Eric Idle's character, Eric Idle, is, he plays Dirk, but he's also the narrator, and I think he plays one or two other characters in this movie. It is an Eric Idle project. He wrote and directed the film. So Eric Idle's character, the narrator, goes to, um, Louisiana, goes to New Orleans to talk to this guy who claims he wrote all of the Ruddles' best songs and that they stole everything from him, and then it's revealed He's just, like, a huge liar. He says that about every band. Like, anytime there's a documentary being made at a, about a band, he claims he wrote all of their songs. <laughs> so, Eric Idle's character's like, So, this trip to New Orleans turned out to be pointless. At great cost to the production. So, it's, it's one of the few movies that really makes fun of, like, the documentary format. Most most mockumentaries are just like, hey, what if this goofy thing was real? Uh, the Beatles all saw this. I think they all had to sign off on it because it was, like, so similar to them. They're like, just to avoid legal trouble, uh, can we get you guys to, like, okay this film? And Eric Idle's talked about, like, their reactions to it. Paul McCartney was the only one who really didn't seem to like it, but uh, his wife loved it, so he signed off on it. And 
Eric Idle grew up around Liverpool, so he's like, all right, you know, fellow Liverpool boy, my wife likes the movie, sign off on it. Uh, Ringo apparently said he liked it, except when it got, like, a little too real. Because, <laughs> to be fair, they do parody some, like, genuine, some, like, actual troubling parts of the Beatles' history. John Lennon loved it. John Lennon really loved the movie, and George Harrison liked the movie enough to have a cameo in it. He he has, like, one or two lines, like, interviewing one of the Ruddles. There's a lot of little cameos in this movie, particularly from, uh, early SNL cast. I think... I, this would have been right around when SNL was starring, starting. I believe Lorne Michaels produced this. Doesn't say... Oh, yeah, yeah. Executive producer Lorne Michaels, yeah. So Lorne Michaels produced this. Um, it had a lot of early SNL cast. It had uh, John Belushi, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd. Oh, what's that lady's name? Gilda Radner. Gilda Radner, that's who I was thinking of. Um, some cameos from all of them. Also, uh... A cameo from Michael Palin of Monty Python. Um, this was this was still before Life of Brian and Meaning of Life even, so it, it's not like Monty Python had quite broken up when this film came out. Um, but it's wild to me that, like, everyone in Monty Python seemed to like Michael Palin enough to invite him onto their projects afterwards. Eric Idle's got him in this one. Uh, John Cleese used him in, uh, Fish Called Wanda. Terry Gilliam used him in, um, oh, goddamn, Brazil. <laughs> so, they all liked Michael Palin. Michael Palin was the favorite Python. Although, they remained on pretty good terms. A lot of the Pythons show up in other Pythons movies. Oh, Mick Jagger's in the movie. They interview Mick Jagger. And he talks about the rivalry between the Ruddles and the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Very fun. Very funny movie. Very entertaining. If you're a fan of the Beatles, if you're a fan of Eric Idle comedy, uh, the, the comedic stylings of Eric Idle, um, I recommend it. I recommend the Ruddles. All you need is cash. This comes with the sequel film. What's it called? Um... Can't Buy Me Lunch. Comes with the sequel film. I've never seen it, but it seems... It's mostly, like, testimonials from people who liked this movie. They talk to, like, Tom Hanks and uh, a couple other people. God damn, it's always... They, they already mowed. They already mowed, because I already recorded today, and they were mowing when I was recording earlier. And then they stopped, and now they're fucking doing it again. How are they always mowing? Like, 24-7. Anytime I sit down to record, they're mowing. I believe Tom Hanks pointed to this as an inspiration for, um, That Thing You Do. Which I've not seen in a long time. I remember kind of liking when I was younger. I haven't given it a watch in a while. I think I have it on VHS. Let me look. Well, I thought I had it on VHS, but it looks like I don't. Yeah, I, I should revisit That Thing You Do someday. Sorry about that, folks. Hope you're ready for me to go on a two-minute rant about my fucking camera. So, the camera I normally use is broken, so I had to get a replacement. Um, I'm just borrowing this camera, uh, and it is an absolute piece of shit. I cannot fix the uh, exposure. I can, but as soon as I hit record, it just reverts back to normal. I'm like, what? Because it's a photography camera. It's it's just for photographs. So I guess the exposure settings only work for photographs and not video. Because why would you need good exposure for a video? The screen is on the back. So I can't, like, see myself while I'm recording. My other camera, I could flip the screen over and, you know, I can see myself on the screen. Which is not a huge issue. It's nice, but I don't need it. The reason it's an issue is because this camera will just stop recording for no fucking reason. 
And it won't even make a beeping sound or anything when it stops recording. So... I recorded 29 minutes of footage and it caught 11 of it. Because I didn't know it stopped recording. Because there was no reason for it to stop recording. There's plenty of space on the SD card and there was plenty of ble battery left. So, what the fuck, Nikon? Anyways, let's talk about Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. Again. Because someone at Nikon took a giant dump and accidentally labeled it as a camera. I did like this. I really liked this movie. <laughs> There's a bit of a spoiler in the video I released earlier this week. I recommended a thousand movies and I included the Dewey Cox story and all of that. So, I, I guess that tells you how much I enjoyed it. This came out in about 2007 and I think it's recently been getting its, like, critical reevaluation. I started hearing about it in mm, 2017, maybe 2018, around the time Bohemian Rhapsody was getting a bunch of uh, Oscar buzz. Uh, people started bringing this up because um, not really a mockumentary. I said it was musical mockumentary night. It's It's a parody of, like, musicians' biopics, and they've only gotten worse since this movie came out. So, people started talking about it a little more. I believe this was first... The first time I heard about this, it was recommended by uh, Dan Olson of Folding Ideas. But I've heard about it two or three times since then. So it's like a decade of never having heard of this movie, and then suddenly everyone's talking about it. And... It's a good movie. I'm I'm glad uh, I'm glad it is getting that critical of a reevaluation because I really enjoyed it. So this is a Judd Apatow produced comedy. It was directed by Jake Sadden, Kasadden, Kasadden. Um, he hasn't really gone into in onto anything else really. He directed the new Jumanji movies, but <laughs> I don't really care about the new Jumanji movies. Uh, stars John C. Riley. Really funny, really funny movie. I really enjoyed it. It's a parody of all of the, like, overly dramatic musician biopics and the way they're structured and the, the stories that are in every single fucking one of them. You know, his descent into drugs and then coming back out of it and then he writes that one song that, like, defines his whole life. It's really funny. Uh, mostly I believe it is a parody of Johnny Cash. Um, the, the title, Walk Hard, striking resemblance to Walk the Line, uh, the Joaquin Phoenix biopic about Johnny Cash, but, uh, clearly it also takes inspiration from a lot of other rock stars, Jim Morrison, Elvis, uh, there's a scene parodying, like, Brian Wilson writing pet sounds, recording pet sounds, which actually they kind of predicted, because uh, this came out in 2007, and then like 2015 we got Love and Mercy about Brian Williams writing pet sounds. <laughs> Love and Mercy is a good movie. I like Love and Mercy. Um, there's another Brian Wilson connection, because they... They make a joke about Dewey Cox being friends with uh, Charles Manson, which Brian Wilson was friends with Charles Manson. And, and on top of all of the musicians that Dewey Cox clearly parodies, uh, some musicians show up in the movie. Um, and <laughs> they're all, like, really interesting cameos. Like, uh, Frankie Muniz shows up as Buddy Holly. Which made me laugh. That was, like, the first one. And then later, the Beatles show up. Jack Black plays Paul McCartney, which is really funny. It's uh, Jack Black, Paul Rudd, Justin Long, and I forget who the fourth one is, but they're, they're the Beatles. <laughs> and, uh, and Jack White is Elvis, which is the funniest part of the movie. Jack White as Elvis is the funniest part of this movie. You wouldn't think it, but Jack White has some serious comedic chops. He's a very funny Elvis. This movie and this movie both have parodies of uh, the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. 
Might be worth it to do like a Beatles movie night. I like A Hard Day's Night and I like Yellow Submarine. So, you know, put one of their other movies on in between those two. Be an interesting night. Um, this would pair, interestingly, with another Judd Apatow comedy, uh, Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping, which I am also a fan of. Uh, that one's more of a mockumentary, but um, both, you know, musical pretend biographies. And in this movie, there's like a scene where Dewey Cox is standing around with all these like topless women. And then there's a guy there who's just, he got his dick out. You see his dick. It's the first penis we've seen at movie night since Caligula, which had 40 penises. Um, so there's just a guy with his penis out in this. And then in Popstar Never Stop Never Stopping, there's another guy just with his penis out. Um, that guy is Judd Apatow. It's Judd Apatow in the other movie. I wonder if it's Judd Apatow in this movie too. Interesting connective thread between those two films. There's an anti-Semitic running gag in this movie that, like, all the producers are not just Jewish, but, like, very, very Jewish. Like, to some degree, I can write that off as, like, a joke, but I'm not really sure what the joke is. Like, if that were, like, a trope in biopics where, like, they, they kind of depict managers as, like, sort of, uh, in sort of an anti-Semitic way... I get it, but I, I, it doesn't seem to be a satire of anything. The punchline just seems to be, haha, we, we said something anti-Semitic. I don't think I get it. Other than that, though, very funny movie. Very enjoyable movie. Uh, I liked it a lot. Um, one of the more popular scenes, there's, like, uh, Dewey walks in on, like, his drummer smoking weed, and... He's like, oh, you don't want no part of this man. And then they go all for all, like, the bad things drugs do and how, like, marijuana does none of them. <laughs> it's like, oh, it must be pretty expensive. It's the cheapest drug on the market. Oh, it must be pretty addictive then. It's not addictive at all. But one thing, he's like, oh, I can't deal with hangovers. And he's like, oh, well, there's no hangover from marijuana. I don't think that's true. I'm pretty sure I've had hangovers from weed. I'm also just bad at sleeping, so I might have just been tired, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure weed can give you a little bit of a hangover. Not Nothing that bad, but I'm pretty sure weed can give you some hangover. Very funny, very enjoyable film. I recommend you look into it. And finally, we ended with Fear of a Black Hat, which I think is uh, one of the most underrated comedy movies of all time. I love it. It is a bit derivative of this is Spinal Tap, but I mean, I don't know what else you're supposed to do with like a musical mockumentary. It's like, because it's just about like this group, they're popular, it goes a little bit over their history, and then it's like, oh yeah, and then they break up, and then they get back together at the end. And that's just, that's just what you do with movies about bands. That's going to be the plot for all of them. That's the plot to Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping. I think Pop Star is way more derivative of Spinal Tap than this movie. Um, although it's kind of... It's almost like Spinal Tap and Fear of a Black Hat combined, and that's Pop Star Never Stop Never Stopping. I wonder if they saw this movie. It's not a popular movie, but I, I would not put it past Andy Samberg and pals to have seen Fear of a Black Hat and use it as inspiration. So, Fear of a Black Hat takes its title from the... Hmm, Public Enemy album? Let me do my research before I sound like an idiot. Okay, it was Public Enemy, I was right. From the, uh, this takes its name from the Public Enemy album Fear of a Black Planet. I think they also had, like, a TV series, like a, a mini-series called Fear of a Black Planet. Um, but it's a parody of the NWA, so... <laughs> Uh, it's it's the rap group the NWH, and instead of being with attitude, they're with hats. I'll let you, you at home can figure out what the N stands for. Uh, so there's uh, tasty taste, ice cold, and tone deaf, and it's kind of weird because tasty taste is so obviously easy -E in name in appearance. In the things he does, he's clearly an Easy E parody. 
ice cold. There's a little bit of ice cube to him, but he's more of like a Tupac. And even then, he's mostly just the director, um, Rusty Kundif. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Kundif? Kundif? He didn't go on to much. He worked on the Dave Chappelle show, and he directed Tales from the Hood, which I've not seen. It's been on my watch list for a while. I would like to see it. But, um... Other than that, he didn't do much. Which is, it's too bad. This is a funny movie, so I assume he is a funny person. And, you know, he worked on the Dave Chappelle show, so... Obviously, he's got some comedic chops to him. Mostly, I think the character he plays in this is just him trying to be funny. It's not any rapper in particular. But I would say he is closest to a Tupac type. More so even than an Ice Cube. Or any of the other Ice rappers. Ice T. Um, Vanilla Ice. They do make fun of that in the movie. There's like five or six rappers who all also have the word Ice in their name. And then there's Tone Deaf, who is not anyone in the NWA. Not in name, not in appearance, not in the way he acts. He's just, um, I mean, he does reference some, uh, 90s rappers, late 80s, early 90s rappers, but no one in the NWA. Oh, we've lost camera again. I think people would actually be surprised how knowledgeable I am about 90s rap because I mean yeah I'm a pasty white kid but also like my interests clearly lie in like heavy metal and rock and roll and classic rock so <laughs> I, th I think people are surprised by how much I know about um 90s hip-hop so uh my friends and I used to do trivia night back in college and there was always a musical round, and I'm like, yeah, I can flex my knowledge. Metal, or classic rock, and they basically never played any classic rock or metal. But they would always play a 90s hip-hop a '90s hip -hop song, and I was always the person out of my group who recognized it. I'm like, ah, that's Wu-Tang Clan, that's the N.W.A., that's Dre, Tupac. I don't know, I'm the guy in my group who knows 90s hip-hop. At least in my college group. I, I, I don't know if I'm the resident hip-hop expert of my group back home. Um, there's a lot of jokes in this that are a, a much funnier if you are familiar with like 90s hip-hop. Because there's like um, Ice Cold, and this is why I say he's the Tupac. Uh, he Like any song he writes, no matter what it's about, he'll claim it's like a political anthem. So he has a song that's called, like, Booty Juice. And he's like, nah, it's a political anthem, because booty is an acronym. It stands for, like, black oppression, and whatever else. <laughs> it's like, it's a parody of the, uh, of Tupac's Thug Life, which is, uh, the hate you give little infants fucks everyone. Got it. Um... And it's... The Tupac was like that. He would write a lot of party anthems, and then he would try to, like, do serious political stuff, and... I don't know if it's 100% fair. I think I think Tupac was pretty good about all that type of stuff. Just a very funny movie. It, it's su super underrated. Like, no one talks about this. No one... T it's one of the least popular movies um, I have rated on IMDb. Or at least that I have in my recommendations on IMDb. Not the least popular. I think the least popular is Flying Ryan, actually. <laughs> so we're really... We're really digging down deep. We're really getting the obscure ones with this series. Uh, Fear of a Black Hat. Highly, highly recommended by me. So, last week I asked you, what's your favorite fake band? And I don't think anyone responded. Maybe someone sp said Spinal Tap. I'll put the comment here if someone said Spinal Tap. Um, I think I'm going to have to stick with Limousine. Like, good old Limousine, homestarhunter.com. It's the reason 
I started listening to metal. Like, that's, that's just a truth I'm willing to admit. Homestar Runner is the reason I listen to metal. Limousine, gotta love them. But I I love fake bands. I had a whole playlist of songs by fake bands. Uh, my first car, I had a bunch of stickers on the spare tire cover. And all of all of the stickers were fake bands. There was Limousine, there was Spinal Tap. I had the Ruddles. Uh, did not have NWH or Dewey Cox. I had Style Boys from Popstar Never Stop, Never Stopping. Yeah, I had quite a few. I'll see if I can find the picture I had of it and put it up here. So, I didn't really think I had a question for this week. So I guess, I guess I'll just ask, uh, what's your favorite classic black exploitation film? Don't say one of the movies I'm about to recommend. It's too recent, it's a comedy, it's, it's too easy of a pick. But I'm still gonna show it tonight. Cause tonight we got a dino mite! Blaxploitation triple feature. We're gonna start with the comedy classic Black Dynamite. And we're gonna watch Rudy Ray Moore's Dolomite. And to finish off the night, Willy Dynamite. Um, the next episode of Matt Presents will probably be in two weeks. Um, because I'm showing these movies tonight, but after this week, I think we're going to go back to every other week, so... Be prepared, there won't be a Matt's, uh, Matt Presents next Friday, it will be the Friday after that. And from there, we will continue to do every other week. And until then, have a good one. <laughs>